Okay, let me go ahead and click on go live really quick. Sorry, I missed that. <laughs> okay, now I can refresh the screen. Give me one second. All right, we are live. Perfect. Uh, give us one second, everyone, to um, get everything situated on our end, and we'll go ahead and get started. Cool. All right, if anyone is joining us, I see we have about 28 people live. Uh, as always, if you guys can give us a one in the chat box, just to make sure that you can hear us okay, see us okay, make sure that we are live this week on the right uh, scheduled live. Testing. All right, perfect. And then uh, while we wait, we're probably going to wait for another one minute, let some people come in. That way we have enough people watching us live to kind of feed the chat with the questions. Uh, a fun thing I like to do every single week is let us know where you are viewing this from. Um, I love to see different people from different parts of the country, different parts of the world, uh, again, tuning in um, on their Wednesday morning, their, when their Wednesday uh, evenings. Again, hopefully we we're able to offer some value and get your guys' questions answered. So perfect. I'm seeing lots of ones. Thank you so much. Check this. We're gonna go ahead and let the um, the chat catch up with us really quick. Perfect. It seems like there's always at least one person from North Carolina. Uh, that's always a fun place. Our in-laws just moved to South Carolina, um, and I think a few people we know that are gonna be moving over there as well. We have Spokane, Washington. Yep, that's where uh, Jesse, my buddy Jesse, lives in Spokane, Washington. You got to make the connection with him. The Bay Area. Wife is from the Bay Area, a lot of uh, familiar locations. Miami, Florida. I might be visiting Miami, Florida end of next month. Uh, we're gonna be going to the Amplified events uh, in New York. So the idea is maybe we go to Florida for a week and then pivot up to new, uh, the four hour event in New York, then drive back, or not drive back, but fly back to uh, California after the fact. Perfect, uh, Hawaii, that'd be my next best uh, place to go visit. Perfect, so it looks like we have enough people here live, so we can go ahead and get started. Uh, again, this is an AMA. We do this every single week at 1 o'clock p.m. PST, where the goal is here is to just answer your questions. You know, I've done, you know, over $3 million revenue on Etsy. I know Hannah's Gardner's done over a million dollars, you know, multi seven figures at this point. You know, we've been where you are now. Uh, we've gotten over almost by any hurdle that you guys are currently experiencing. And the, the hopes is, is we can help you get over those sticking points, over those hurdles, that way you guys can continue the growth in your business. Um, so with me this week is Hannah Gardner. Uh, Hannah, would you mind kind of introducing yourself, where you're coming from, and and uh, what you're up to these days? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm Hannah. I also have a YouTube channel, um, primarily selling physical, well, I've only ever sold physical goods. I've never done print on demand, but I know a lot about print on demand. Um, I have a home decor line and then I used to have a fast fashion accessory line that I've sold the majority of my shares in at this point. So my main focus is really just uh, YouTube and actually I'm building a software tool that is going to serve Etsy merchants and obviously the home decor brand um, that I started like one year, one and a half years into my venture um, after I started the jewelry company. So yeah. Perfect, exciting. So yeah, Hannah's uh, channel is, is Hannah Gardner, so feel free to look her up. And the software that she mentioned is called Profit Tree, ProfitTree.com. It's going to be one of the first um, ever Etsy-specific softwares to where you can have in real time data on the profit of your business. So it's one thing to you know have revenue, but is it like you can actually integrate your Printify account and your Etsy account into the software and have real time, real data, like what is your profit? So you can make more educated decisions based on the cash flow, the profits, the revenue, and making the right decisions. So super excited for that to go. I think right now you're opening up the wait list for a limited beta. Um, so rush over there, sign up, because I think it's limited to 500 spots and knowing Hannah's audience, that's probably gonna fill up here pretty quick. Yeah, for sure. If you guys wanna get on the wait list, um, we don't have like a dedicated website yet, but if you wanna go on Instagram, you can find Profit Tree, and then there's a link in the bio to sign up for the waitlist there. Um, but also on my channel, I'm sure I'll be announcing a lot more as we get closer. Hopefully in March, we'll be launching, so. Perfect, love it. All right, guys, so you go ahead and start posting your questions in the comments, and then again, like, we're gonna try to take them one at a time in the order that they come in, uh, kind of bouncing back and forth between Hannah and myself. If, again, the questions do come in pretty quick, and they're always uh, updating, so if we happen to miss one, uh, please just copy and paste it back to the bottom, and if we get to the end and we don't hit all the questions, feel free to then copy and paste it into the comments, and I'll try to get to it either um, in the comments or next week um, on next week's AMA. So. Starting from the top, uh, someone says that they're still working on SEO. That's always something to be ever working on. Uh, the next question is, how many listings do you actually need to see consistent sales? So that is, 
there's no correct answer to that one. So it depends on the niche that you're selling in, it depends on the product category you're selling on, it depends on the marketplace you're selling on, and ultimately how well are you positioning yourself on the marketplace. So I know there are a lot of people who sell apparel, they have a thousand listings, like, hey, I've only done 20 sales a lifetime, I've been live for you know six months, versus myself, you know, I only launched about 100 designs, 100 listings per product category, and each product category we sold in did multiple six figures. So. Um, I don't think there's a magic number. What you need to, instead of thinking of, thinking of a number, a number equals a number of sales. I think you should be thinking of just making sure you're doing everything correct, that you're doing the correct product research and the correct market research, the correct, which is the designs you put on uh, the products, the correct SEO, and then, um, and then sales will come if you're doing everything correct. And if you're not doing Etsy ads, I do think you need to turn Etsy ads because I'm always a big believer in Etsy ads. When you launch a new listing, you're not ranked on page one. All the sales are on page one. Um, so you have to kind of pay to play to get there and then eventually organic will take over where once balanced about 80% of your sales will be organic 20% through paid ads and that's when the profit kind of kicks in. Cool. Cool. Do you want me to pick up the next question or? Yeah, any ones that are tagged for Hello Custom, you can kind of skip those ones and I'll take those ones. Okay. Uh, so I'll hit, I'll hit the next two really quick. So, um, yeah. so Kendra asked, uh, does Hello Custom support pattern features in Printify? So I believe we actually just got this one in our support as well. Uh, so Kendra actually might be my support person. Um, so anyways, so right now uh, the, the Etsy API, there's things that we can do and things we cannot do currently with the API. We are working with their head of development to make more uh, allowances with our software. So a few things that we can't do right now that hopefully we can do in the near future is uh, for example, patterns. Um, so if you are doing a pattern product, um, we don't, we're not able to replicate the pattern onto the product. So that's really popular for like blankets, like a name baby blanket. The way to get around that is by uploading the complete pattern to Hello Custom as a single image, and then the complete pattern to Printify as a single image. But the downside is you're gonna have to tag every single name. Uh, hopefully in the near future, we can allow the pattern um, feature to be uh, available with their API. Uh, the next one is, a uh, question was, uh, if, you, if you select background colors, for example, I think mugs or blankets, where you just upload uh, a white transparent background to um, Hello Custom, and then it will, correct, it will grab the correct you know, background color from Printify. That's also another element that we're not able to read. Uh, we're not able to access that information from Printify yet. Uh, so again, you'd have to create a you know blue version on Hello Custom to a blue version on Printify, a red version on Hello Custom to a red version on Printify. But again, uh, we are working on making those both of those um, easily accessible, hopefully in the near future. Cool. And then uh, the next one for Hello Custom was I've been having some issues you can set with Hello Custom. If you reach out to um, support at hellocustom.io or we have a chat box in the bottom right where we have live support Monday through Friday about 7 to 3 or about 8 to 4 uh, depending on what time we get started for the day. So uh, during the weekdays, right now there's someone there live that if you reach out, she'll be able to help you. Awesome. Do you have, you have one question on the successful pet memorial frames? Do you want to get that one? I'm not sure. Uh, let's go ahead. So first, thanks uh, for what you do. My question, can you elaborate on your success for pet memorial frames? I'm curious if you'll expand on the logistics since you didn't use Printify. Um, so the product that we ended up doing was, uh, it was kind of like a picture frame. It was almost like a picture board where it was an eight inch by 10 inch uh, sublimation board where we printed like a wood pattern onto it plus a quote. And then we ended up screwing on a little clasp where they could hang their photo. So it was like a picture frame and then it would be a stand that they could sit onto a uh, maybe a bookshelf or they could hang it onto a wall. So it was more of a picture frame. Uh, we ended up doing a product tutorial where you can have a similar product, but using Printify's canvas. So Can Printify has an eight inch by 10 inch canvas. So the same size, uh, the only difference is you'd actually have, to have the, the, the picture printed onto the product versus having them grab that four inch by six inch uh, picture and then you know clipping it onto the thing. So in terms of the product, very similar products in terms of the size of the market and the opportunity, the exact same size. Uh, very funny, um, there are a lot of graphics coming through all the custom right now with, with that exact same template. So there are people as we speak right now who are selling pet memorial picture canvases through Printify using Hello Custom. So it is, it is working. Cool. All right. I'll grab this one. How do you price items strategically to increase the likelihood of a customer to buy a product, product from Christine? Um, 
Yeah, Stephen, actually, you can give me your input on this, but especially in the POD space, like one strategy that I see that actually works really well, not only in POD, but even in like my space, what we would do is we take the least sold variation option and we actually make it slightly cheaper. Um, and in POD, in some cases, like you would take the least sold variation option and even make it like a good amount cheaper than all your variation options just to earn that click. Um, and some people are like, well, don't you just piss people off by doing this? And I can definitely promise you like the pros outweigh the cons on this. Like here's an example with our pillow. We have, we sell really high end pillows. Let's just put it that way. Pillow covers. And some of my competitors will make a price jump from like set, like it will show six pillows in the main image for $17.99, right? And then you click on the listing and what that $17.99 actually gets you is just fabric samples. And the jump from $17.99, it goes from $17.99 to like $450. But it's still a best-selling listing with 20 added cards, a bestseller badge. Like you might get a few people complaining here and there. Um, same thing with my accessory company. We did the same thing, especially when it came to like bundling, um, stuff like that. So it's even though you can't bundle as well as you can with like physical products, you know, it's still the same idea of like being able to show a cheaper price on the front end. And honestly, I would even split test this with maybe like if you have some really like some performing listings or best selling listings, right? Like you could split test this for yourself and just see um, what happens with the CTR. The CTR is like the surefire sign that, um, you know, it's it's helping if your CTR is increasing, obviously. Um, but yeah, I mean, in the POD space, because you're already dealing with like pretty low ticket items anyway, like if you, uh, you know, make it 30% cheaper, it's definitely not going to kill your conversion rate overall, I, I would say. But again, Stephen, you can input anything on that if you have any input. <laughs> yeah, so it's a very common practice to have a low display price. So uh, Etsy, they display your, your cheapest variant on the click through level. Um, so if you have like your extra small pink as $9.99, but all your other sizes and colors for a shirt, for example, are like $17.49. At the click-through level, when someone searches mom shirt and they scroll through all the listings, it's going to show $9.99, allowing you to display cheaper than some of the competition and more affordable that you get the click and they're that much more into the funnel of buying your product. That By the time that they realize that it's actually $17.49, you've already got the click, they've already looked at the listing images, you already fell in love with the product, the design, and then when they click on the variations, it's like, oh, actually a medium blue is $17.49. They're more invested at that time when they see the true price point. And they're like, okay, right. it's actually more painful to leave than to just continue with this product. So it's becoming almost standard practice. It's almost like if you're not doing it, you're the only person not doing it. Uh, so I highly recommend it. It was a strategy that we did. Um, Essentially, in terms of pricing, I always consider seventeen forty nine my magic number, and um, and six ninety nine my magic uh, shipping number. Where um, I always had the thirty five dollars uh, free shipping guarantee. So if someone bought one product for seventeen dollars and forty nine cents, it was that. If they bought two, it's thirty four ninety eight. They're two pennies away from free shipping. Forcing them, if they want free shipping, they have to buy one more product. That third product would pay for the shipping, and then my profits would be the same with three products as two products. You're never out. Um, I just did a product tutorial last week where uh, for wine tumblers at $19.99, it's less profitable than at, than at uh, $17.49. Um, so it, you, you can be more strategic knowing the limitation of the $35 free shipping. And then in regards to the $6.99 shipping, uh, I, I, I'm a big believer in A-B testing and split testing and things like that. I tested, you know, like $2.99 shipping, free shipping, all the way up to $6.99. And the conversion rate stayed almost very, very much consistent all the way up to $6.99. So if you're selling a product that's like a shirt where maybe shipping is let's say $4.99, you're able to charge $6.99 and make a $2 profit on the shipping, uh, which on print on demand about $5 is average uh, in terms of profit. So you're adding $2 to your $5 profit, that's like a 40% um, increase in your margin. So that's definitely kind of like my two magic numbers that I highly recommend if you're selling a product that where that kind of fits um, to charge that way. It probably won't work for a sweatshirt or anything that's more bigger or heavy uh, where it might go to priority, but um, anything more lighter and cheaper. That's kind of my magic pricing. Cool. Cool. Um, there's a question here. How many marketplaces do you list each of your POD designs on? That, uh, that's a POD question. <laughs> you got that one, Stephen. <laughs> yeah. So a uh, great question. So personally, um, I know Printify makes it super easy for you to take your products and copy and paste it over to another marketplace. Like you can take your designs from Etsy and, and copy and paste it over to Walmart and eBay and and, and other marketplaces like Shopify, 
but it's always like everyone's limited in the amount of time they have in a day, the amount of bandwidth they have and, and things like that. And market, new marketplaces require new knowledge, new learning curves. Um, I personally would say right now on Etsy, I think the opportunity right now is on Etsy. I know I've talked to many other people who've tried Walmart and eBay and things like that, that they're different customers and they buy different designs. Uh, you know, and someone who buys things from eBay might be a different shopper who buys something from Walmart is a different shopper who buys something from Amazon. They're different shoppers. Therefore, different designs will sit well with different people. Therefore, you're always having to design different for different marketplaces. Uh, again, I think right now the opportunity is Etsy. Again, I always preach, I think the next opportunity when Printify finishes their API integration is Amazon, uh, but more towards personalization so you're not competing with the FBA products. Uh, jumping into the next question is, uh, is personalized products better to sell or pre-made design products? So. Um, right out of the gate, I, I've always been a believer in personalization. So I've personally sold over 220,000 personalized print products on Etsy alone. Uh, we were a top uh, Etsy seller in the world. And 100% of our uh, products were personalized. Uh, my buddy Jesse, who's been selling for a few years longer than myself, the one that got me started, again, 100% personalization between uh, Etsy and Amazon, sold over $10 million, 100% through personalization. So the in my personal opinion, I think the opportunity is personalization. Um, I think millions of people right now are, are jumping into the Etsy print on demand, you know, you know, wagon. And if everyone is selling on the same marketplace, Etsy, we're all using the same print provider, Printify. We're all using the same, uh, therefore, products like apparel or mugs or tote bags for the same price and the same lead times and the same quality. Very similar designs. It's almost impossible to stand above the competition. But only 1% of the competition is doing personalization. So that could be the easiest way to stand above the competition and have that continued success is with personalization. So I think if you want to have success in your business, if you want to have that continued growth, um, I think personalization is the only way uh, to, almost to, to guarantee that. Yeah, I definitely agree with that one. This one says, uh, which of your YouTube videos um, is it that shows how to add different SKUs to create drop-down menus for different products on one Etsy listing. Is that for me or do you think that one's from you? Because I talk about that a lot, but I'm not sure if that's a big yeah, so. Yeah, so I'm a big believer in design variations, uh, essentially selling multiple products on one Etsy listing so they can shop the listing instead of the shop. It helps your conversion rate, it, allows, uh, again, it, it, it helps a lot. A lot. Um, if you go to my YouTube channel, I think the one where I explained it in the most detail was the phone case tutorial. So if you go to, which is all the way back in Halloween, uh, but that's the one where I explain in more depth the, the strategy behind it, what led us to that decision and, and how to do that. I also use talk about that in I think the um, the mug tutorial, but then I kind of like, kind of branched away in on my last two tutorials. So if you watch the phone case one, you'll be able to just skip to that that segment and then kind of hear the reasoning behind that one. Okay, this one I got this one. <laughs> would you? What would be your favorite, most recommended social media platform to advertise your products? I'm just opening my shop, and I feel I can only focus on one pl platform until I get the hang of things. So, if you're a completely new shop owner on Etsy, I'm assuming that you're talking about you're launching on Etsy. Um, you have such a learning curve coming up within that first year. There's just so many things that you're learning, new information you're ingesting from you know, software and designs and competitor analysis and all the all the things, right? That really your best time spent, your best money spent is in that best, like best return you're gonna get in that time period is learning Etsy ads, like in my opinion. I think that's the best dollar in time value spent for the return that you're gonna see. It's just not likely unless you are just come out the gates making viral types of POD designs with great personalization and you just come out the gates with viral products and you somehow manage to find time in there to like learn a whole social media strategy on TikTok or Instagram. And then by the way, you have half your day being spent just making viral potential products on behalf of your products. It's really just like not worth, unless you're that person, which in the beginning, it's really unlikely that you are and you're just that viral content creator that already knows how to do that plus design. Um, so that's why I say like in Etsy, you really want to show Etsy as well that you're harnessing Etsy doing all the things that they want to see when you're a new shop, which is building competitive listings, having good value propositions, doing the right pricing strategies, right? And then another key element is there is Etsy ads, right? So playing all the games of Etsy in the beginning. And then when you have, you know, your research and development streamlined, you have employees maybe helping you, um, you know, everything is kind of 
operate it, uh, SOP'd out, right? You have procedures for how you run all the different parts of your business. And then you have time to focus on, you know, another sales channel that is social media. Then I would say, okay, now we can take, we can step, step back and look for further growth on something outside of Etsy. Now I'm not saying don't just not have social media accounts, like show that you exist on Instagram, show that you exist on TikTok, right? There's actually a lot of good strategies that you can do to harness social media with just like following up with your customers. Um, that is just like free traffic from the hottest traffic that you have, which are people that have already purchased from you and driving those people to your social media accounts and stuff like that. Um, but as far as dedicating time and energy and trying to learn how to become a content creator, it's just not the most valuable spend of your time or money spend if you were hiring consultants or something to learn social media, right? Like the best dollar and the best time spent is in just launching more listings, learning Etsy, learning how to be competitive, and then it's like getting your Etsy ads to the point where you've tweaked the dial so good with your Etsy ads that you know, you have a really good cost per acquisition or marketing cost percentage at the end of the month. Um, and that stuff takes time. So yeah, that was my elongated answer on that one. I'll, um, I'll kind of touch more, more base on that one and then it kind of segments into the Rise and Thrive question. So uh, again, I like to test everything. So like when we started our business, I tried Pinterest, I tried Facebook ads. So like paying on a different platform to drive traffic to Etsy. I tried, we hired a marketing agency to do Google ads. Like we were trying all these different things that like everyone talks about like social media and presence and off, you know, omni-channel and things like that. Um, and in terms of like the return on investment, Etsy ads beat everything hands down. And it makes sense because people are going to Etsy with the intent to buy something. They're searching for something like gift for mom and your product is showing up top of page one for gift for mom. It's like they're going there to go buy something. They're not on like Google for searching something on Facebook scrolling and you're trying to get them to convert. Your conversion rate on your Etsy listing on average is like two to 3%, which means 33 people have to click on your listing with the intent to buy, to just buy once. Now, like how many likes do you have to get on a Facebook post to get 33 clicks to then get, you know, 33 likes, let alone 33 clicks to get one sale. You know, so that's, that's kind of why, again, like in terms of bandwidth, we're all, we have a limited time in the day. Etsy ads hands down out outperform any effort we put on any other channel, advertising, not advertising, that paying experts thousands of dollars a month to do it for us. So could not be our Etsy ads uh, metrics. And then again, Etsy ads is a, is a button. You turn it on, yes or no, how much per day? And then you kind of set it and forget it. Content marketing, you're after them create new posts every single week, updating your ad graphics, monitor, monitoring the ads uh, and to get less of an ROI. So again, that was my experience. I'm a big believer in Etsy ads, uh, which drives me to the next question. They, they, they tagged this one for you, Hannah, but I'm just gonna go ahead and take it because it's uh, uh, kind of, it's my answer goes back to Etsy ads is it says, what's, uh, what's it says, Hannah, what's more advice to someone who has tried to do everything that has been told to help SEO and still waiting for their first sale, but you only launched, uh, but she says, I'm only one week in. So I think that's the, the one reason why you haven't gotten your first sale is I, I recommend you to go to your, your, your stats and see like how many impressions do you have store wide? How many clicks do you have store wide? Knowing that the average conversion rate is like, let's say 2%. Do you even have collectively on a single listing 50 clicks? Uh, maybe you have 37 clicks. So you just haven't had enough eyeballs and enough clicks to even at average get your first sale because you're only one week in. And even if you turn on Etsy ads from day one, it typically takes Etsy about a, a week to kind of index and know where to show you before you even start to show in search. Uh, so that's even with ads, let alone without ads. So I, I just don't think you've had enough time, enough visibility that will come with time naturally. So I think just uh, continue to do what you're doing. It sounds like you're doing the research, you're putting in the work, just continue to do that. And then sales will follow in time. There was one thing I can add to that um, as well. If you're talking about SEO in terms of like, I know SEO can mean a lot of things, but when I think of SEO primarily, I'm thinking of like keywords. And just one thing that I want to point out with a lot of what, I'm not saying that you're doing this by any means, but like a lot of times people attribute like to the lack of sales or the amount of traffic they're getting to SEO. But if you're using all the tools, if you're using E-Rank, if you're using Everbee, or even if you're not using tools and you're just looking at competitors and looking at their keywords and their keyword optimization, right? Like there's only so many best case scenario keywords that you have available to you for your products. And it's likely after you've done a decent amount of research, right? You kind of know what those best case scenario words are. And so what a lot of times people like to do 
um, when they're not seeing the return that they want or they're not seeing the traffic they want, they immediately want to go, oh, it's because of keywords. I'm doing something wrong with my SEO. But I just want to, I'm not saying that keywords don't matter. I'm just saying that normally, in most cases, it's actually like a product problem. It's not an SEO keyword problem because I would argue um, actually that like um, nowadays, like, their algorithm, their AI, like knows what your product is without you even using keywords, <laughs> like almost just based off the image. Now, I'm not saying don't do keyword research or anything like that. I'm just saying that um, if you know this goes on for an extended period of time, like if you're one month or I would say even like a month and a half, two months, three months in, and you're still like not getting any sales, then I would say okay, maybe it's it's definitely probably a product problem or um, you know a design problem, not an actual. SEO problem, if that makes sense. And also just, you know, maybe uh, not putting it, not investing in ads as well. So um, when you turn on your account for the first time and you try to just go the organic route, it's just a lot more, it's just slower and more painful than just like coming out of the gates trying to spend on, spending on Etsy ads. Um, so yeah, just all those things. Like there's many variables. But again, the key thing, like you said, in there is your only one weekend, which is <laughs> really like, you know, even with me, it, with my accessory line, like I don't think I got one sale for the first two and a half weeks, and then we still like killed it in the first year. <laughs> so um, I think, you know, maybe just a little patience there too as well. Yeah. So it's, yeah, in, in short, there's a, there's a ton of different variables. It's too soon to be able to have enough data to track those variables. Again, going back to Etsy ads is another benefit to Etsy ads is it kind of expedites your time to receive that data to make educated decisions. For example, if you turn on Etsy ads and let's say your budget's, let's say $25 per day and you're only spending, let's say 50 cents, then you have a click through problem, meaning that Etsy's not spending your money because it's pay per click. Therefore, it might not be the product or the design, it's, it's the click through level, meaning that's maybe your price on the front end is too high, maybe the display price strategy might work or your, your thumbnail image isn't enticing enough. Um, or you're just not, or your SEO might be not relevant. So you're showing in the wrong places. Um, if they are spending your money, but you're just not getting any sales, then you have a conversion problem. Then it's like, hey, maybe it is the product. Maybe it is the design. Uh, what what led me to um, make this design and choose this product? So like, it allows you to make those educated decisions that um, waiting organically would take longer for you to make those choices. Um, jumping into the next question, um, there's a fly flyer on my face in case you guys see me swatting it around. Um, is it better to have only one product like a mug in, in a store versus uh, products, uh, plural, like mugs and search and things like that? So this is dependent upon who you ask. Uh, so some people have found success with selling a single niche, you know, one, it's a niche specific shop. Uh, some people have found success having product specific shops. And I found success just being everything and every, for everyone, you know, multiple products, multiple niches, a hybrid shop on all levels. Um, and again, there's no wrong answer. Uh, so I just want to throw it out there. Um, because again, people found success in that strategy, therefore they teach that strategy. I found my success in this strategy, so I'm going to teach this strategy where the reason why I believe in having multiple products and multiple niches in, uh, in one shop is if you're niche specific, you're not showing up for, you're only showing up in terms of, if this is like search volume, you know, people go to Etsy, they search for something, you want to show up for that search, right? If this is search volume and you're limiting yourself to one niche, you're only showing up for right here and you're missing out on all this opportunity over here. Uh, same thing is sometimes I'll type in niche in a product like gift, you know, per, uh, mom mug or mom shirt or gift for grandma sweatshirt. You know, if you have one one type just mugs, you're missing out on the sweatshirts and the tank tops and things like that where there's just as much opportunity. So I believe in multi product, multi niches on the front end for that reason. Um, but on the back end, in regards to like you know social proof, like on your if you have a hundred reviews from your first product launch and now you want to go launch mugs, when you launch your first mug. You already have a hundred reviews underneath that mug listing. Uh, so one of the products, now that our shop is off and comfortable with sharing the numbers, um, we also sold, do uh, sold uh, dog collars was one of our products. You can't get it through Printify. That's kind of why we launched it. We sold $1.2 million in dog collars. Um, and uh, one, the number one seller at the time was TagPub. He has a YouTube channel. He's very open uh, with the strategies and his products and things like that. But we launched uh, our version of that product. And with, with I think we had like 13,000 reviews. We had more reviews than the number one seller on Etsy and we caught up to him within weeks. Uh, so, that, and again, I don't think we could have done that organically. I don't think we could have done that without ads. And I don't think we could have done that without leveraging the reviews from our previous products. So piggybacking off the success of your, of your previous launch products. Yeah. Ooh, I have something to add on that one too. Um, I, if you, l let me know if you agree with this, but yes, I think definitely should expand your searchability with multiple different types of products. But if you're starting out for the first time, uh, Stephen, would you recommend to try to tackle all or just focus on one, mastering one for that education purpose and then branching out? 
uh, one product. Uh, so I would start like to say you, you did your market research. You say the product I want to start with is mugs. You know, then go build fully build out mugs. Uh, you know, 100 listings, 200 listings, 300 listings of mugs. Okay. I wouldn't. Uh, I would. I don't believe in the strategy of uh, again from my experience. Other people have found success in this strategy. I'm not harping on anyone else is uh you know you find one design that you like and then you go put that one design on a shirt and then a mug and then a tote bag and then a sweatshirt and then a, a tank top and you just put that one design across the board because it takes it takes all that time to go create all the listing images all the seo work create just for all the different products for the one design versus creating your product images for one product category and you can just scale out designs once also you'll find what sells well in terms of design for a shirt might sell well for the same product types like shirt sweatshirt tank top but it's not going to sell well for a mug. You know, those are two different product types. And what sells well for a mug might work well for a tumbler and a wine tumbler, but not for a tote bag. So you, I, that's you got to do the market research on a per product basis. Uh, but again, I would recommend starting with um, one product type, scale it out fully. Then the next, that's kind of what we did. We did about one to two products per year, but we didn't launch a new product until this one was all the way built out. We fully optimized it. We fully optimized the production, and it was it was chugging along where we, we can then step aside and let this one just grow. Cool. All right. We got a question here. You described adding options to your listings to increase the conversion rate, but do you have any thoughts for how digital shops can increase their conversion rates? Alternate alternatives are not allowed. Alternatives, I'm guessing she's saying variation options are not allowed. So one thing that I think is important on Etsy that Etsy actually a lot of competition I feel like is losing. So this actually could really help you is that I mean, in digital downloads, like, I don't know, you have a lot of image slots that may get wasted. So it's like, what other things can I put in those image slots? And I feel like anytime you put a personal touch to something, so like, if you have like a few extra extra image slots, like, if you can integrate storytelling into that anywhere you can, like putting a face to the brand is super, super huge. So, so like one thing that um, we did, you know, is <laughs> there's a whole uh, image dedicated to showing um, that this is a family business, showing our family <laughs> and like our faces. Um, and then in the video slot, it's like us actually, it's like a filler video of making the product. So if it's digital downloads, it's like, you know, those TikTok videos where you're like waving to the camera, showing how you design things. Um, and you can go on like TikTok Creator Studio or like follow like small business, hashtags on like reels and TikTok, and you can see the types of videos that go viral and for um for digital downloads it's kind of like well what kind of vid video slot there right so um anything where you're putting a face to the brand or doing a little bit more storytelling in the in those positions like i would utilize that and again like that type of stuff it literally can't hurt you it can only help the conversion rate because if someone's on the cusp and then they can like identify that like oh this is actual like a real person behind this brand and i didn't have to go to your storefront and go read your about section because they're probably not going to go read it anyway but you like force them to see it right all those little things can only help um and not hurt another thing is just outdoing the competition when it comes to bundling with digital assets like if someone if the majority of people are offering a pack of 50 do a pack of 60 right so whatever that is for those niches um you know just offering more value for you know a slightly more expensive or a good competitive price point yeah so to kind of uh, talk on that a little bit more so first of all i don't have any experience with digital um, listings absolutely none because i'm not a graphic designer and I don't have any uh, faith in myself to create something good enough to even charge 99 cents for. Uh, so I always just like bought graphic designs, you know, SVGs, added a text element below it, Samantha 2023, and sold it. Uh, so I, that was kind of the route I went. Um, you know, so, but, but if you are a graphic designer and you have that skill set, I think digital uh, assets and digital products uh, are a great business. You're selling the bullets to the war. So uh, one thing that kind of allowed, like when I would do that, you know, as, as a customer, that allowed me to either convert or bounce was based on like the usage, right? So sometimes I would be like, oh, it's an amazing graphic. I'm going to go put that on a mug. But then I'd read it's like, hey, it's for personal use only. I was like, oh, can't buy it. We went and found someone else that did. So a lot of people on Etsy right now that are looking for graphic designs are doing it for personal, or it's not personalized. They're doing it for print on demand. You know, you're selling the bullets to their war. Uh, so if you're not allowing uh, like resell usage, you know, for uh, print on demand, I think you're, you're missing out. You're serving a smaller market like for personal use versus like for resell. Uh, so that's one thing I'd throw out there. Um, but beyond that, I don't have any um, experience beyond just being the customer of someone like yourself. Uh, the, the next one is, uh, the, the chat just refreshed. Uh, 
Here, uh, this is in regards to like, my launch strategy. So in regards to, I lost where we're at, but they asked essentially, um, so my launch strategy for Etsy, I have a YouTube video on this on my YouTube channel, is essentially when I launch a new listing, you know, it's, it's ranked on page 15 by default. I want to get to page one because on page one, that's where all the sales, that's where all the traffic, that's where all the eyeballs are at to get those, those sales. About 80% of sales acquire on page one for a given search term. About 80% of the 80% are on, on the top half of page one for the search term. So I want to go from page 15 to page one fast. Uh, the number one variable to drive rank is sales velocity because everything else is dependent upon that. Like if you have a good product, if you're relevant, good conversion rate, you know, good quality score, like that typically leads to a sale. So uh, Etsy looks at your sales to drive rank for that given search term. So when I launch a new product, I drop that product to my break even price. That way it converts more and I turn on Etsy ads. That way, uh, if it's something I wanted to sell for 20 bucks, I might drop the price to $9 and then run ads to it. That way, when I'm on page one, I'm half the price of everyone else. My conversion rate typically doubles and I just skyrocket to page one within two to three weeks. So the question was, do I do that on a per product basis or do I do that shop wide? I do that when I launch a new product. So mm -hmm. I, I, I never did apparel where I had thousands of listings. We typically capped out about like 100 to 150 listings per product category. And we would average maybe about five to 10 listings per day. So we were only like launching designs listings for like a couple of three weeks, roughly. So we were just like, you know, this day's worth of listings, we would, you know, break even launch it. The next day we'd launch it. And it wasn't like a, like a hard three weeks where we were like hitting them. It was just like, you know, roughly when we finished launching designs, we would go back and start turning them up to the, the main prices depending on rank. So uh, I do that as I launch them. So if you're doing apparel where you have like, you're launching, let's say five a day for, the next six months because you want a thousand listings just do them as you're creating them and then maybe like hey on friday i go back and i check you know my my three weeks ago and then just like you can make kind of a process that way okay i can get the next two they're pretty pretty straightforward so um to be eligible as a star seller you have to ship your products on time how how do you do this as a digital product seller we all know digital products don't ship their products so when you specify and you're that the listing is a digital asset, Etsy's gonna know that because Etsy's the one sent, fulfilling the order for you and sending them the file. So you don't have to worry about that. Uh, the only issue that you would ever run into for digital assets is that, like, if you didn't specify that it was a digital download and it was a digital download and you were manually having to send them the file and then you were like delayed on whatever the processing time was that you like sent it to. So if you have a two day processing time and it took you six days to send them the file, then like you would get flagged or whatever. But because digital assets, you tick it as you tell Etsy, it's a digital asset. You're never going to have that issue. And then the second one is what is a re reasonable percent of returns or problems? I'm specifically thinking of Printify. So uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Stephen, but I'm pretty sure most top POD Etsy sellers, they don't even accept returns, especially if it's personalized. So you don't really even have returns because you put it in your policies that you don't accept returns. But maybe you can go a little deeper on what, how do you actually deal with complaints like that? Yeah, so that, that always blew my mind. It's like every Etsy seller, like I'll take 99% of Etsy sellers, like you go to the listings, it says returns not, not uh, they do not accept returns. I was like, why do you not accept returns? Like, like this is customer service. Uh, so and, and whenever we launch in all of our products, we always have like a love it guarantee. It was one of our images, it was in our description, and it where essentially says like, if, you're, if you don't 100% love this product, it doesn't matter if it was broken, if it was misspelled, it's like if you, just, if you don't love it, let us know, we'll give you a 100% refund, no questions asked. And the reason why we were we had a refund policy is because we only had like a 1% refund rate or less than a 1% refund rate. So it's the question is, is like by having that, is that helping our conversion rate by 1%, like with the payoff? But even even if even if we were paying a little bit more in refunds than, than the increase in conversion rate, I still wanted to offer that, offer that in terms of customer service. Uh, in regards to Printify, if they're asking for a refund because there's something wrong with the product, like bad print, Maybe uh, they got the wrong size that they ordered or there's maybe a tear in the shoulder. If there's anything that's wrong with the product, um, if you open up a case with Printify, you provide proof, um, they will refund you, then you can refund the customer. So you're not out any money. It's more so if they just like, hey, I, didn't, I don't like it. Uh, I want a refund, but there's nothing wrong with the product. Um, again, you can have a refund policy or not, and then you can just uh, be, you know, hold, hold strong to that. Cool, right, cool, see. cool. Thanks. So the next one is how do you advertise POD products on social media if you don't have uh, the actual products? Um, so again, we talked earlier, I don't know if, you, if you're jumping in late, but uh, I'm, not, I'm personally not a big believer in, in social media uh, just because in terms of it's, it's, off, it's off channel, people are going to Etsy to buy the product. Uh, in terms of bandwidth, if, you're, if, if you don't have a social media and you're looking to build one for the product, I think you, you get a better ROI for your time. Just take that time that you would spend building social media 
to launching more products. Uh, you'll get a better ROI for your time. But if you have a social media following, but you just don't have the product, then you're just promoting, I think like the, um, the images that people wear in the shirt, you know, like the, um, I forget the name of those products. Um, okay. Uh, would you suggest adding a bunch of videos to your shop? The, the ones that can be up to three minutes with sound. I don't think, is that a new thing that I don't know about? I always thought it was no sound. <laughs> uh, as, as far as I know, I, I mean, again, it could, they're always adding new features and testing things. And so sometimes I found out, find out about things late. Um, as far as I know, I don't think they allow videos with, with sound that if that's a new feature, it's new to me. Uh, but in, in, again, the benefit to a video, if done right, I don't, I don't think having a video for a video sake will help your conversion rate. But if you have a video, um, that better portrays the product, like you have to remember, like when you go to Walmart or target, um, you get to grab the product, you get to feel it, you get to, you know, try it on test it. Does you like it? Do you like the feel, um, you get to like, look at the label to, to be able to make that buying decision on Etsy. They're limited to what you show them, like limited to like, I mean, images you show them, what you describe in the description, the sizing chart. So that it's, it's, it's more of a digital sale. So if the video allowed them to kind of like show like, Hey, it's like a stretchy material, it's soft, you know, someone putting it on and trying it. I think that would be a, a video worth having, but if it's just a video where it's just like a pan over, like the, those mock-up videos where it's like a pan over the shirt and it just has the logo just sitting there, I think I would just save the money and save the time. I don't think it's going to help your conversion rate. One thing that I, one thing I would actually, I might argue with you on that one is if it's, because like say you don't want to spend the time and do it properly and like do a video for each unique product showing the texture, blah, blah, blah. Like if you don't want to do that, just make a storytelling branded video of maybe you with some of your products, but like doing something where it's just like a montage of you putting a face to the brand, you showing you like with your product. I don't know. It doesn't have to have sound, but it's like one of those TikTok videos where there's like text going where it's like, this is my family business. This is um how we design our products i don't know something that's just like storytelling where, where it's putting a like an actual face so that you're the face of the brand because that again like there's so many people on pod and like a lot of these shops are using that you know the home feel personal touch of like humanness so i think I, that could help you increase your conversion rate it couldn't hurt you by any means but um definitely could help um, one other thing that we did for a video, we did this with, with, when we launched the dog collars is when we launched the dog collars, we had no reviews for the dog collars and no like, you know, customer photos for the dog collars. Um, so when we got our first 10 reviews, uh, we went to like, can I think we used Canva and we just literally just like pasted in like the 10 reviews. Um, and then we, and we just, the, the video was, it was just like a review, a review, a review. So it was just like, it was social proof. So it's like, yeah. uh, it's like, Hey, it's a new product, social proof. Other people are buying it. And again, it's like, if other people are buying it, then it must be good. A bunch of five star reviews. And that kind of helped kind of offset the fact that we had no reviews on the channel is we kind of highlighted our, the 10 reviews we did have uh, to make it seem like it was like a booming product. Um, so you can also do that uh, where that's like one video. That's the same video that you're putting on all listings for that product type. Very similar, like Hannah mentioned, is you can have one video that's you know brand wide. You can put it on all listings or you can have one video that's product specific wide and put it all on all that product type. Cool, cool, cool. This one says, I really want to start a POD business, but I live in a country where Etsy does not support payments. What is your advice or how would you help? Um, I personally have like a, a friend. I don't know how difficult it is or what country you're in, but um, I don't, I know that you can open an American business not being an American citizen. And like my friend, he lives in Croatia, but he has owns an American entity, right? And so by doing that, he can open an American bank account. Um, I'm not saying it's easy, especially if you, depends on the jurisdiction and, and the, the relation that America has with your country or maybe Canada um, or any any country that basically supports Etsy, right? Like how hard would it be for you to open a business there? But for the most part, most countries allow for you to open corporations as an international person. Um, but that would help you open a bank account and then be able to open on Etsy and then have your shop set to America. Um, if you have anything to add on that one, Stephen. Uh, no. So whenever I get a question about, um, you know, someone in a different country, I don't have any experience in that. So therefore I don't feel comfortable giving any advice. Uh, if, if I've experienced it, I'll give you all my advice in the world. But if I haven't, I, even if I've heard something and I haven't experienced, it, I don't feel comfortable with sharing it, but it seems like uh, Hannah has some good advice for you there. Um, the next question is if analyzing best sellers and researching shops to model, you're likely going to, uh, for high level niches. What are some ways to add some value to broad level niches? 
that are uh, already swamped with successful listings. So, so I'm convinced that Etsy shares the love. Like on Amazon, it could be one listing getting 99% of all the sales and they're making a million dollars and every other listing is making a pennies. But on Etsy, it's like the, the, the love is shared where it's like, for example, ornaments where like we've sold over $500,000 in Christmas ornaments. Uh, April, one of our top users on um, Hello Custom, I have an interview with her on our YouTube channel. She launched ornaments based on my ornament tutorial. She's like, I, she's like you promised me I could make six figures with ornaments. So I went and did it and she made six figures with ornaments launching it you know, a month before Christmas. She made as much revenue as I did launching ornaments during Christmas for us as a brand new shop. And I've been selling ornaments for years as a top Etsy seller in the world. Uh, another buddy went and launched um, three Etsy shops. You know, I, I don't know if it was all ornaments hidden, which you can't do, but or families. And he sold more ornaments than I did because it was, it, there was just like more shops sharing the love. Um, and he made way more ornament sales than I did. Again, I was at number last Christmas. I was a second Etsy shop on all of Etsy. It was like, um, there was like number one and then we were number two and then all these people are up to our level. Um, so again, that's beyond that. Again, I, I wouldn't be scared of these top selling niches, these top selling shops, because I think, uh, there's a lot more in their algorithm. Even location is a part of their, their search, what shows up in your search. Um, so I'm never personally scared on the niche, the competition. If you're, if, if, if the people that you are analyzing are successful and they launched in the last one or two years, they are just almost just as new as yourself. Uh, so if they were able to figure it out and carve their spot in the market, so should you. Uh, so I would never shy away from anything like that. Cool, cool, cool. Um, someone's asking what's the best way to connect with Jesse? Should I email you a su at support? So I think Jesse, I think Instagram is one way. So I think it's Jesse teaches, uh, I believe is his handle on Instagram. Uh, inner circle prints, plural.com is his, uh, website for his, its course and exclusive fulfillment. Uh, I know his, he's doing open enrollments, which is why we kind of featured him a few times on the channel just to help my buddy out. Uh, but those are probably the, the two ways to do it. Maybe even Jesse at inner circle prints.com might even be his email. Uh, so those are three different ways you can get a hold of Jesse. Cool. Mia, I love going back and watching your old videos from when you started, like when you said, I legit thought Etsy was broken. Yeah, my old videos, if you guys go back into some of my old videos, they're pretty funny. But um, yeah, <laughs> but there's a lot of information in them too. Um, someone said, uh, Kieran said, hi guys, thanks for doing this open forum for people to ask questions. No problem. Thanks for joining. Um, we also have a question. Do you guys have any advice for professional artists who have experience in design that want to open an Etsy shop where they would possibly have a bit more of an advantage than the average person? Um, where they would possibly have a bit more advantage advice. So I, I guess if you're selling like higher ticket art or your true artist, uh, is that how you read that? Steven, like they're a real artist. Yeah. Looking. So if you have if if you have a skill set, you're kind of in an unfair advantage. Where I, I would say, again, from my conversations with a lot of people, is probably 99% of people um, who are doing Etsy print on demand right now are first time entrepreneurs. I think that's very common. Who are not graphic designers like that? I fall into that category in regards to like when I started Etsy, I was I tried and failed a few things, but I was new to that. I'm not a graphic designer, but again, found success. And there's a lot of people who are in that bucket that are finding success. Um, but again, if you are coming into this and you're like, Hey, I'm a first time entrepreneur or maybe not, but I have graphic design skills. You have that going for you. So like I mentioned is I went down the POD route or some, you know, uh, print products because I wasn't a graphic designer. I bought the designs, put onto the product and sold it. Uh, so you could go that route where you're creating the designs yourself and then selling the products, but you could also go down, go down the route where, you know, like, uh, there are a lot right now, it's really pop popular to sell, you know, digital files, digital clip arts and things like that, where you are selling the bullets to the war, you know, like you can you can create a design for $2 or $2 and 99 cents. And it's, it's all profit. You know, there's nothing other than the Etsy fees. So it's super high margin that just, they can sell over and over again. Um, and people need, there's a lot of demand for that. So I think it's just like, where's your interest? If it's more creating for the art or creating for the product and which audience and which uh, customer base you want to serve. Cool. But I, I will say there too is, 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 it's almost to our advantage as non-graphic designers because we, we have no input in regards to like what we like to create, what we like to design and the fonts and colors that we, we like. We just create what sells, you know, like I have an Excel sheet that's my master list and I know from, you know, my success attributes that it needs to look like this. And I just go create that because I'm not an artist, but I would say uh, I've heard some people where they are, are artists. Like one of our workers, she was an artist and I tried having her create some designs for us. 
but she couldn't get out of her own head. She's like, but it just looks ugly. I'm like, it doesn't matter if it looks ugly. It's what's selling. She's like, but I would prefer that here. I'm like, you got to get out of your own head. It's like, that's not what's selling. So you got to kind of balance the two. And again, you know, in time you will find your spot in, in, in what works for you. Yeah. That's definitely a thing. It's like, if you're, if you're too high level and it's like, Oh, it's really sometimes. Yeah. Like you said, hard for those really high level artists to find that balance. Cause it's like, I don't want to make this ugly this one said is it smart or okay putting one design on multiple different products yeah. yes definitely if it makes sense to put on multiple different products if you're starting out for the first time i would probably not try to tackle different product types i would just really master one before moving to the next but eventually as you become the master of um, that get a proof of concept for yourself then start expanding to different types of products what do you think of the advice that new shops should only list one product per day until they reach 100 listings? Um, I don't know who gave that advice or where that came from, but um, it's really that what's That one might be out of fear. Uh, I, again, right now it's super common. Etsy is just suspending new shops left and right. Uh, my, oh. my theory is, is, is fraud is super big on marketplaces where people will create, like for example, Etsy, an Etsy account, launch a product for sale, People doing fraud will steal someone's credit card and then buy that product a bunch of times and then they get paid off from Etsy and then the credit card wants all the refunds. And so um, I have a buddy who launched a marketplace way back in the day and he had like two hundred thousand dollars in fraud, like his second month of going live on a business um, as a marketplace. So I think that's why Etsy's doing that is they're trying to crack down on fraud, but they're just they're right now they haven't finalized a, an efficient way to do that. Um, so I don't think launching one per day for the next uh, three, four, five months would increase or decrease your likelihood of getting suspended. Um, again, we would, we would launch a purse about 10 per day. Uh, but again, that, our shop got launched three years ago when this was less of a problem, um, when there was literally like, Etsy was like one fifth the size. So, and I, and I personally don't have experience whether or not that would be efficient today. I wouldn't, I wouldn't limit yourself, your growth that much, where if you're doing one per day, you're just limiting your growth. I would just give it a hundred percent right out of the gate. And then, and then if you get suspended, you've done nothing wrong, you appeal the case, you'll get your shot back. And then you just go back to full scale mode. Um, the next question is for Hello Custom. Does Hello Custom work with vertical text? So we are, we are the same as Canva in that where you can have a text element and then you can rotate the text element. So it could say Steven this way. What we don't have the ability is uh, like, like with Tumblr, sometimes it's like they want, you know, K, you know, fa facing you know, horizontally K and then A and then, you know, like the, the, the letters this way. So we, we don't stack it like, like a sandwich, but you can rotate the text element and then it will personalize it with any with any angle of the rotation cool. um uh i'm not sure on this one why is the price for my etsy listing about 20 percent higher than the original price i entered if you're changing your price in the etsy platform it should be true to what you what you put so i'm not sure what's going on there it sounds like a glitch or something if, if you make um an up like for example if this is a printify product and uh, you made an update on the printify listing and you publish the changes over to etsy they kind of check what things you want to get updated and pricing is one of them so if you if you published it over to etsy so again this might be what happened might not but i'm just making a theory here if you publish it over originally and you optimize the listing and then you put your prices here and then went back over to Printify and changed one thing and hit publish, it could overwrite the, the, uh, the pricing. So beyond that, I'm not sure why the prices would be different. If maybe a sell was running at one point, now it's not. But um, again, I'm not entirely sure about that one. It might be a glitch. Uh, Etsy customer support might be best in that one. Okay. I got this. This is a good one. What CTR do you consider your baseline for ads? So CTR, um, I mean... Stephen probably can give you more better metrics for POD specifically, but when you're analyzing CTR in your ads, right, your best, you're always competing against your last best metric. So if historically on your data sample of your 500 new listings that you just launched, and out of the 500 listings, you know, your top performer is getting like a 3.3% CTR, right? That just raised the bar for the new standard. So now you're always competing against your last best metric for ROAS, for everything. And you're always tweaking the dials and optimizing for what was the best, right? So um, now as far as what's industry standard or what best CTRs you've seen for POD, Steven, I guess you would have more insight on that. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to pull my, my Etsy shop real quick to you guys, give you guys my average. So just for anyone who's new, uh, CTR is click-through rate. So 
when Etsy is displaying your ad on page one, if someone sees it, that's an impression. And if someone clicks onto it, that's a click. So it's impressions divided by clicks uh, or, or maybe the other way around. So it's like out of how many people who are seeing it, they're clicking onto it. So it's asking uh, what is a good click through rate? So me personally, I never really tracked my click through rate. I, almost, I always just tracked um, what, what my average was, was my ROAS, which is return on ad spend. So how much, pro, how much revenue you made on the sale that was from the ad placement. About Etsy kind of averaged about 30%, which is not profitable for most print on demand products. Uh, the reason why I kept uh, them on, and I recommend everyone else to turn, keep them on, is because uh, that those sales are driving your organic rank. Uh, and right now, like if you just if you just started, like maybe like all of your sales are coming from Etsy ads because all your organic is like below page five. But like as you get sales through ads, your your organic rank is gonna go from page five to page three to eventually to page one. And when they're on page one, that's when you'll start getting more of a blend of organic sales versus paid sales, and you're not paying the advertising fee on the on the organic sales. And my average uh, store wide, again, three years of data, I think was like eighty percent organic, twenty percent uh, paid. So like so we pay to play to get this eighty percent here that, that has less of a cost. Um, and then so that, then you think about. Tacos, T A C O S. There's, there's all these uh, terms here where it's like total advertising cost of sale. Like, I spent a hundred dollars in Etsy ads, but how much were that relative to my total sales for the day? Uh, because that organic, uh, those that spend led to organic sales and it led to paid sales. So I, I add those two together, and that averaged to be about thirteen percent. Um, so we're thinking about like total thirteen percent proportional to maybe your twenty twenty five percent profit from Printify. Um, I'll, have to, I'll have to get my stats for you later. It looks like I have to do some custom date ranges. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah, I mean, the only other thing I would say with the CTR, like, whatever one, like, when you sort it by what's the highest, I mean, it's it's worthwhile paying attention to what is getting the highest CTR because you can look at, okay, well, what niche was that talking to? What mock-up did I use? What was the value proposition, right? All those things because then it's like, all right, well, let's do more of like that, right? Because that's obviously getting a lot of clicks. Now, obviously, CTR is just one metric because we also want to analyze what one is actually making us the most revenue. Um, but I, I do like to like look at both. Um, okay, here, I think this is one's for you, Steven. What do you mean social proof from previous products? You mean reviews from one listing as social proof and another list or social proof and another listing? Yeah. Or you mean all the stars you have as a store are social proof? Yeah, so social proof being shop sales and shop reviews. So Etsy displays the reviews at the shop level and not the product level. Like when you go go to Amazon, for example, and you click on a product and it says 35 reviews, that's the, that one product has 35 reviews, but that seller might sell 100 different products. So this one has 35, this one has six, this one has 15. On Etsy, they, they sum all those reviews together and they say, hey, this seller has a thousand reviews and then on, on the listing level it says a you know shop name thousand reviews you know 500 sales or you know 5,000 sales so um, so when you launch into a new product category that that listing has zero sales uh, the product has zero sales it has uh, probably zero favorites zero likes um, zero reviews um, but it still will say you know 5,000 sales for the shop and a thousand reviews so therefore it has the social proof that hey this shop is selling. Um, and that allows you to then piggyback off of the success of your previous products for any new launch products. Because the alternative is, hey, I want to go launch a new product. I'm going to go launch a brand new Etsy shop. Then when you launch that listing, it's going to say zero sales, zero reviews. Here's my product. You know, which one's going to convert better? Which one's going to have a higher click-through rate? It's the one that says 5,000 sales, 1,000 reviews, and the product that you just launched today. Cool. From Hi Ho, Hannah, great answer. I love that you mentioned those extra photo slots. Cool. Glad you liked it. You also commented here as far as digital bundles, people are offering like millions of the things for 20 cents. Yeah, there is certain niches where, yeah, there's like mega bundles, but they're still selling them for nothing. But with that being said, there is a lot of digital asset opportunities that are selling high ticket. So I just did a consult with this girl that is killing it and she's selling Shopify templates, digital download digital templates for like shop for websites like so stuff like that or like these high ticket opportunities and obviously if you have a good design eye and design skills right just focus on going after higher ticket digital assets and there is a lot of them um, or even like uh, our friend Cassie paid somebody you know like 
what did she pay someone? I don't know, someone on Fiverr to make her like an Excel sheet that makes you calculate profit. And now she's selling it for $30. And it's something that she paid probably someone in India like $20 to make. And now she's selling it for, and just made it prettier with her branding. And now um, she's killing it with like calculators or anything that's like a, like a Excel spreadsheet or something like that. Um, I recently made. I do want to say. Oh, uh, I do want to say we, we are at our sixty minute limit. So it, man, time flies when uh, we're having a lot of fun, right? So uh, we, maybe we'll stay around for five more minutes, try to answer a few more questions as they come in. Again, this will be a replay on our YouTube channel. So if we did not get to your question, if you could just please copy and paste that into the comments below, we'll try to get to that either Hannah or myself. And then if not, uh, again, we're here next week at one o'clock with another special guest. I do just want to give a big thank you to Hannah for again, making yourself available on this Wednesday to just offer pure value for the last hour, and as well as a big thank you to everyone else who's uh, here and attending. You guys are doing anything on your Wednesday, but here you are investing in yourself, uh, trying to get your questions answered so you can invest into your business. So you can everyone congratulate you guys on that. Um, Hannah, where can people find you if they want to learn more about yourself, your story, and what you're up to? Yeah, my channel is Ecom Hannah, or you can just type in my name and I should show up. Hannah Gardner. Ecom Hannah is probably easier to remember. Hannah Palindrome, H A N N A H, backwards and forwards. It's the same. Um, so, yeah. Perfect. And then again, profittree.com is your software. I'm going to throw it out there because you're kind of like, I know, I know you do. There's no way for you to sign up for the, the, uh, the beta from there, but where can someone get that link to join? The okay. List? Yeah. Though their profittree.com is, it's not even active yet, but what you could wow. do is you can, you can follow oh. me to get notified or you can, um, you can go to Instagram. So there is an Instagram. <laughs> there is nothing on it, but if you want to get on a wait list, there's, uh, we're offering like a one month free plan like it's better than just the trial period it's like actually like an intro offer um so you can go to instagram and go to just profit tree uh in two t's p profit tree together um and there's a link for you to get on the wait list there so you'll get notified and um you'll get that one month free mm. yeah super exciting again like with the, the the power of this software and why i'm so excited for it is you're gonna be able to integrate your etsy accounts integrate your Printify account and then know your true profits in real time. And my, did I make profit on that sale that I just had? Not revenue, but profit. And then you can make better educated decisions on your pricing, on the products, what products are trending, what products are not trending. And again, again, it's just one more tool for you to have that much more success in your business. So yep. um, it, it seems like there's been a lot of questions in this uh, AMA for um, Etsy ads. Another question to ask if we have any videos that kind of go over all these terminologies and the strategies. Um, I have one video on my YouTube channel, which is like my launch strategy, where I kind of go over my launch strategy, but not necessarily an Etsy ads training. I have been hesitant on launching an Etsy ads training because I know um, it's kind of more high level. But if you guys want me to create an Etsy ads training, again, I've spent over $250,000 in ads. It was my number one driver to ramp to over $3 million in revenue on Etsy. Um, if you could just comment below this video, uh, it's not in the chat, but in the, in the actual video, yes, I'll go ahead and I'll make sure uh, to create that video for you guys. I want to make sure there's enough demand for that type of content that's more high level, uh, something like that. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and take one more question. Maybe if Hannah wants to take one more question, then I'll let you guys get back on to your Wednesday. Mm. Oh man, we got a lot in here. Um, do you Let's have see, any? Uh, I'm, gonna grab one. I'm gonna grab one from the bottom. There's, there's a lot that came in last minute, so I'm just gonna grab the one from the bottom. It says, uh, this may have been asked. I had a, I had to step away for a few moments, but do you have all of your Etsy listings set to auto renew or do you go uh, through them and renew them each manually. So I personally have them all auto renew. Uh, I know it's like, I think it's like 20 cents per six months. And if you have thousands of listings and only 80% of them or only 20% are selling, I do see how that could, could add up. Yeah, for me personally, I only had no more than like 300, 400 listings at a time because I didn't scale any product category that high. So it was never, um, uh, a big expense for me personally. So I would just like look at your business, look at your expense. Is it worth it? Yes or no? Uh, the benefit to leaving them on and letting them auto renew is when it was, if it's selling and it doesn't auto renew, then you, then you might, hey, why are my sales slow for the day? It's like, oh, that one that was killing it, it, it accidentally, I forgot to auto renew it. Uh, same thing, a big question gets asked is like, we just got out of a bunch of different holidays, like, uh, you know, Halloween, Thanksgiving, and Christmas. Do you leave those ones active or not? Uh, and my, my personal experience is I always leave all these things active throughout the year, especially the ones that are you know holiday specific or event specific, I just move it to the bottom of my shop. And the reason why I do that is because I want it to remain its rank. I went through the launch strategy, got all of the sales, I got ranked to page one. I don't want to turn off sales. And then and when I turn it on 12 months from now, I'm, I'm back to page 15. I'm playing catch up going into the season again. 
when I try, uh, going into the new season, all of the early shoppers are buying my products. And as I ramp, I'm already on page one. So I personally leave all my listings on auto renew and I leave all my listings active. I just sort my shop on what's relevant at any given time. And turn ads off for holiday seasonal ones, I'm guessing, right? I, I personally leave them on. Uh, I'm, oh. Again, I'm a lazy entrepreneur. The only reason why I leave them on is because it's pay per click. Uh, and that's okay. and that's dependent upon search demand. So if we're not in Halloween season, no one's searching for Halloween phone sure. case. Therefore, there's no impressions. Therefore, there's no clicks. Therefore, I'm not spending anything. Uh, oh. Versus like, oh, I forgot to turn it on, you know, going into October. So um, again, it's pay per click. So it's proportional to the demand. The demand is proportional to the season. So I personally leave it on. Yeah, good answer. All right. All right. All right, you guys. Thank you so much for again joining us for AMA episode seven. I will be here again, same time next week, Wednesday at one o'clock PM PS time with a new special guest where they can give you their spice and their experience on the way that they found success. It's, it, there's no one size fits all as we kind of discussed a little bit into this episode. Again, if you want me to create a in-depth high level Etsy's ads training, the probably most in-depth one on YouTube, again, comment yes below the video and let me know that there's enough demand for that kind of content.